Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. It looks like we're just having a bit of a um, tech difficulty. Um, Meg, it looks like we're not going live on your page. Or perhaps we are. I'm, I'm not sure what happened over there. Um, good morning, everybody. Lynn Hay Salmon from Kaboki. If this is streaming live on Meg's page, I'm not 100% sure. Then um, I'm a blogger in South Africa and I blog about parenting and mommy stuff. And today I've got Meg Four with me and we're going to discuss getting your baby to sleep through the night, which is a really important topic for every single mom and dad on the planet. Um, just to quickly let everybody know, uh, join in the comments in the you know, join in the discussion in the comments and you could win the Parent Sense app, which is, is your, this is your app, Meg. Yes, the Parent Sense application is, it, it's based on the Sense series books um, and um, yeah, the Parent Sense app, which is for babies birth, um, birth to 12 months old. Awesome, perfect. Um, and Meg, if you don't mind telling my readers a little bit about yourself. Mm. Sure, where do I start? So um, I'm actually an occupational therapist by training. Um, and um, I was one of those um, lucky students that I ended up having all of my blocks in just exactly what I wanted them to be in, which um, blocks are those kind of practicals that you have when you're at university. And it was always around infants, because I think from the time that I started OT, I knew I wanted to work with um, babies. Interesting, my work is actually a lot more with moms in some ways now, because moms are, you know, you know, mums are where the need is and they're wanting information. So I work with mums and babies. And then in about um, early 2000s, I had my own two children. And after my second child was born, um, I, my husband actually said to me, you know, you really do need to write a book because I had was kind of telling him all the time about what her signals meant, what how her development was going, you know, when to put her to sleep. It was all of that sort of thing. And he said, do other mums know this? Because maybe you should write a book. So I wrote my first book in 2002, it was published, Baby Sense. And um, it was very funny um, because uh, Lynn, I actually said to my husband, listen, I don't know that it's a very good book. So if, if you see it in the shops, you must just buy it so that everybody thinks it's a good book and it's, it's always being bought. So <laughs> we had this plan if we were gonna buy the books. And of course, what ended up happening was within a month, we had run through the entire um, uh, first run of the book and it became a bestseller. So that was the first book. Um, and then subsequent to that, um, there have been seven additional books. And the most recent one of which was Allergy Sense, After Weaning Sense. And I've written everything on uh, around parenting from, um, from pregnancy, which is um, my pregnancy sense book, through to sleep, feeding, weaning, and so forth. Um, and have started three businesses. So I have three businesses. Um, my first one I actually sold. That was the Baby Sense product company. Um, and that, that product, that business I started in 2005 and sold it in 2014. So you can still see the baby products around sometime, the cuddle wrap and the taglet. Um, and then my second business I started was um, called PlaySense, which is an education business. So um, for little two to three year olds or two to five year olds can come to little play groups that we train up the teachers and we have the most wonderful curriculum in people's homes. Um, and then the third business is obviously my app, which is my most recent business. And, um, and that's a yeah, digital application on the iOS store and on the Play Store. Yeah, I had a look at that app online and it looks really funky. Um, you know, it keeps mm -hmm. everything in one place. So you can track the feeding and the sleeping and everything else. So, yeah, I, I, I really like the look. I would have liked that when I was a new mom because mm -hmm. I, I really I was I was floundering as a new mom, as I think possibly many new moms do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it actually was an, a the decision to make the app came into 2019 when I had actually popped into another influencer's home to wish her well for her having had a little baby. And I took my weaning sense book and I had also sent her a baby sense book as well. And she said to me, oh, yeah, thanks for the book. Um, she was talking about baby sense. She said, I don't know if I'm going to read it. I'm not much of a reader. Can't you put this all in an app? And it made me realize that, um, you know, kind of new generation of mums um, want information delivered differently. First of all, on digital platform, um, definitely, because we ha we have our phones with us all the time. But also, um, people don't want information that's generic. They want it bespoke to their baby. And the only way you can do that is through an application. You know, in, in any other format, um, 
you know, whether it's websites or, or any other digital format, it's it's not gener it's generic, it's not bespoke for your baby. And so we set about actually creating advice that was really, really specific to where, where the baby's at. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. So everybody, if you want to visit Meg's website, it's megford.com. So, and there is a link on there through to the Parent Sense app as well. So before we get into, um, you know, me asking you questions, I just wanted to let everybody know that I've, you know, what my personal experience with sleep was, and I had an exceptionally bad experience with one baby and an exceptionally good experience with my second baby. Um, with my first baby, she refused to sleep through the night or the day or anything um, longer than two hours at a time. So from the time she was born, for the first, if, if the funny thing is the first few days, my husband and I looked at this baby and we're like, she doesn't engage with us. All she does is sleep. She doesn't, like, when are we going to get to, like, actually meet this baby? Famous last words. Um, and then within about a week or two, she just stopped sleeping ever. Um, and... I am a recovering alcoholic and addict. I have insomnia. I was a terrible sleeper as a baby. And I had no sleep during my pregnancy at all because I had to go off my psychiatric medications. And yeah, it was it was beyond trying for me um, and for my husband. I'm sure I was pretty nasty. <laughs> so yeah, she slept for the first time at the age of three years and four months. Yeah, and that's crazy that's a lot of sleep deprivation it was it was insane and i mean by that by that time my son was already over a year old um wow. and then in comparison my son just slept when he was tired i mean he I, I didn't know that came like that i mean he was tired and he just closes his eyes and then he's snoring <laughs> so you know there's there's such complete differences and my daughter takes after me. My mother had a very hard time with me. Um, by the age of two years old, she was so desperate and she'd taken me from doctor to doctor um, that I was actually sedated at the age of two uh, by the doctor. So I was sedated for a period of time because I was having night terrors. I wasn't sleeping. I was keeping the whole family up. Um, and that doctor at that time said that the only way to get me catching up on my sleep that I've never had for my whole life was to sedate me. So yeah interesting <laughs> story i'm not sure what the doctors would say now but for any mom that is absolutely at the end of her everything i have so been there so my my kids are now nine and seven thankfully they sleep through every night it's amazing and i'm back on my meds so i sleep every night i get eight hours sleep it is so cool but i remember being a zombie and i remember the pain and frustration so i'm very excited to hear what you have to say today meg and to hear your tips absolutely yeah i mean i think every parent's experience of sleep is different um, and every baby is so different as you noticed with your own kids um i had three um little ones um their sleep was um fairly similar i mean i don't think it was a big difference between them except for my firstborn where i made all the mistakes and so when James was kind of seven months old, I needed to um, I needed to get, get get him to sleep through the night and I did some sleep training. He was my first experience of sleep training. I, I did a method called the Ferber method, which was at the time quite popular. Um, it was before I'd written Sleep Sense. And it was only later that I actually, you know, kind of came up with a totally different method that didn't involve, you know, cried out. But the Ferber method did actually involve cried out. My, my second baby, she slept through two weeks and she always, she just always slept. And I mean, even until she was, um, in grade one at seven years old she used to have a midday sleep for two hours she just she was just a sleeper and to this day if she gets sleep deprived she gets sick so you know so she, so she sleep is very important for her and then my little one obviously was um was was much easier so you know than, than my firstborn he, she, i mean she was she was a slow to my baby but she did um sleep because i had all the strategies in place she probably she was a reflex baby so she probably wouldn't have slept as well um, as she did, um, but I knew what to do. I knew exactly, you know, what steps to follow to make sure she did sleep well. I think I think that makes a big um, a big impact. I mean, with my second baby, the pregnancy was easy, the birth was easier. The I mean, everything, the breastfeeding, the panicky mom <laughs> thing was gone. Yeah, and I think it kind of slides into place. But of course, I was the second born. Um, my older sister was, should we say, normal, not 
you know, I mean, she, she didn't sleep 100%. No baby does, really. Mm -hmm. But um, she wasn't a problem sleeper. And then mm -hmm. I came along and my poor mother. And then my younger sister was very, very easy, a very mm -hmm. easy baby. Yeah. And my mom was different. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, then that kind of highlights that it is, I mean, it's a relationship. There's a certain amount that we do as parents that influences sleep. And particularly as first-time mums, you know, we sometimes make a few errors as we go along, obviously. First baby, we as inexperienced as they are. Um, but there's also a big component, which is the baby. And so sometimes um, parents will take it all on themselves, like your mum, if you if you were your mum's firstborn, she would have thought that she was a failure. You know that she hadn't managed to that she had this tricky baby. It was her fault. The fact that you were her second baby means that she knew that she could do it first time round, and that it was more to do with your personality. So it's certainly um, you know kind of it's a relationship that comes. Both mum and baby bring their own things to the um, to the sleep environment. Yes, totally, totally. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, I would like to know what are your best tips to get your baby to sleep through the night? Yeah, so they, the tips actually vary depending on the baby's age. And, um, you know, I think my, my first tip, I would, I mean, let's start with the newborn. My first tip for newborns is that they can have day-night reversal. So my biggest tip there would be, um, that means basically that babies are waking up more at night than they are during the day. And so they become very sleepy and kind of have these long stretches of like four and five hours between feeds in the day. And then at night, they're waking every two hours for feeds. Um, and my um, tip on that one would be to make night feeds very calming, soothing, and don't rouse your baby too much. And don't even change the nappy if it's not dirty, um, if it's not soiled. Um, and in the day, you've got to make it really interesting and active and, um, and, and, and engage with your little one so they really get the sense of the difference between the day and the night. And if your baby is not awake after three hours between day sleeps, wake them so that they feed by at least four hours during the day. So that would be my first tip for newborns. My second big tip would be around feed to sleep because, you know, I think when I, and I run my sleep course um, every couple of months, we, we're just finishing one up today, actually. And the hardest thing for mums is when they've been feeding to sleep because, you know, if you, if you hit six months old and your baby's expecting like six breastfeeds in the middle of the night, to stop that is really, really difficult. So my second tip would be um, to try and separate feed and sleep from about six weeks onwards. So to try and... Um, you know, wake your baby up after you finished feeding them so that, you, that when you put them down, they've actually got to pop themselves off to sleep on their own. Um, so I would definitely, you know, separate out um, feeds and sleeps from about six weeks onward. And then my next tip would be between four and six months. And that's a time um, where little ones can develop sleep regression. And, um, it, and But it's also a time that we know from the research that if babies actually work out how to actually sleep, go back to sleep at that age, they become self-soothers, we call them self-soothers, and they become typically very good sleepers. And so it's this kind of critical window period where we've got to get it right. Um, and part of that is not over responding to your little one, um, allowing her um, to um, yeah, not, not cry it out, but to fuss a little bit if she wakes, you know, after, after 20 minutes or, or if she's going down, like actually just give her a little bit of opportunity. You'll, you'll be surprised at how little ones actually can sort themselves out and go back to sleep. And that's a critical age for that. And then moving on to the second part of the first year, I think the next tip would come at about seven months, and that's teaching your baby to use their dummy on their own. Um, because then one of the other big reasons for um, babies waking at night is because they expect the dummy to be put in all the time. And um, under seven months, they can't actually do it themselves, but from seven months, they can. And you can start to teach a little one to use their dummy on their own. Um, and then all the way through for all of the age bands, I would um, be looking at um, day sleep routines and just making sure that your day sleep routine um, supports a, night, a good night, night sleep routine. So, yeah, I think in a nutshell, those would be, you know, my top tips with regards to um, helping a little one uh, sleep through the night. Okay, well, you've highlighted a number of issues <laughs> that I had because, I mean, for me, you feed your baby to sleep. You put them on the boob and... Then they go to sleep and you quietly, gently put them in their cot. <laughs> yeah, and, and the problem with that, um, you know, and, and this is where parents go wrong. The problem with that is that when you do that, um, they wake when they wake in the middle of the night, which all little ones will, they actually expect whatever you were doing when, in the evening to be reenacted. So if you fed them to sleep at 6 p.m. and they wake up at 1 a.m. and your, the, you know, your nipple's not in their mouth, then they're like, okay, I need it back. So it is a, I mean, I mean, and, and that's a very important principle. Uh, how you want your little one to settle themselves in the middle of the night must be what you do in the early part of the evening. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then do you think that dummies, I mean, do you advise moms to use dummies? Because you Yeah, I love mm, I love dummies. I you know, and I think dummies get a bad rap. People don't want to use dummies because they think that I don't know why I don't know why they don't want to use them. I don't know if they think they're dirty or they think that I actually don't know why people don't want to use dummies. But the reality is, dummies are um, babies have got more oral receptors or more touch receptors in their oral area than anywhere else in their body, and so that means that they can soothe using their mouths. And so whether they're going to suck their thumb, suck a dummy, or suck on your nipple or on a bottle, they derive pleasure from that. And it does help them and settle to sleep. And of those four scenarios, the thumb, the, the boob, the bottle, and the dummy, the dummy is actually the one that they can use independently mostly. Well, of course, the thumb as well. But, um, but I, I'm a great fan of dummies. I have no issue with babies using dummies. Um, you know, we, I think where parents get um, freaked out is if they, when they see toddlers walking around with dummies in their mouth. And, I mean, I do think that there is an age where, you know, dummies, you don't have to get rid of them, but you start limiting them only to um, sleep time. And I normally say that's at about 18 months, because if your little one's walking around with a dummy in their mouth all the time, they start to lateralize their sounds, and it's not great for their language development. And so it's way better for them if they actually only have their dummy at bedtime from 18 months onwards. Yeah, I, I wish my kids would have used the dummy. They didn't like dummies or comfort blankets, nothing. Um, yeah. My poor battered boobs. I was <laughs> always running around trying to put a dummy in their mouths, but they, they just didn't want it. Yeah. So that was a little bit frustrating. I just wanted to know, what do you think? What is your personal opinion of the cried out method? You know, where you, where you get told, put your baby down, close the door, and don't open the door until 5 o'clock in the morning, no matter what happens. What is your opinion on that? So the answer to that question, you know, kind of comes back to what is the goal when you're getting your little one to sleep through the night? And the actual goal is not to have them so-called sleep through the night. The actual goal is to have them self-soothe so that when they do wake up at night, because all children, all babies wake up at night, but when they do wake up at night, they can put themselves back to sleep. Now, the ability to self-soothe is a, it's a life skill and it's something that babies have to learn. And if you think about any life skill that you can think about, whether it's riding a bicycle, learning to read, um, you know, any life skill that you would want to teach your, your child, you wouldn't just hand it to them and get them to go ahead and just do it themselves. You know, you really come alongside your child and you teach them. So when, you, when your grade one child is learning to read, you don't stick a book in front of them and tell them to learn to read. You do it with them and you hold their hands and you support them. And... Um, it's a very important part of parenting, you know, and, and and to teach your child to sleep through the night is something called, take something called co-regulation. That's the ability of a parent to assist their child, to read their child's signals, to support them to learn, to use their own strategies to self-soothe. So you can see it's a learning curve. Now, what happens when you walk out the room and shut the door and you don't come back until the morning is that you really are saying to your little one, right, you, you need to sort yourself out. You're on your own. Instead of saying, right, I'm going to come alongside you and I'm going to help you learn how to sleep through the night. So I'm not a big fan of, of the cried out method. I think that um, I think I think on a couple of levels. Number one, I don't think it's teaching a skill. It's just teaching a child to give up on crying. Um, whereas you know, if, if you if you're alongside them, you teach them a skill. The second thing is, I think it can be quite traumatic for little ones and for mums. Um, you know, to, to have a child crying it out is, is traumatic. Um, and so I'm not a big fan of the cried out method. Um, I do think the other ways that are much more gentle to get babies to sleep through the night. Yeah, I, I, you know, by the time my daughter was about two, I was desperate enough to think about trying it. And I read that you've got to put the baby in the cot, walk out and close the door. And so my husband and I discussed doing it and we thought we, we can't close the door. I. I just have a thing, like, I can't just close the door and, you know. So we mm. kept the door open, we put my baby down, and we sat in the lounge, and we listened to her cry, I think, two minutes, and we're like, okay, this isn't for us. Yeah, <laughs> no, just very hard. Just parenting style and my heart and all of that. Mm. Um, do you do you teach um, moms the, uh, what is it, the pick up, put down method? No, I don't. I, I have two methods um, and it's very individual. I mean, one of the things that um, mums will know about me is that I'm not prescriptive. So you, you have to do what works best for you. Uh, one of the methods is the pick up, put down. I find it's quite confusing for little ones because if they've cried enough, they get picked up and then they get put, put down again. It does work, but it's a little bit confusing. 
But the method that I actually use is to just sit with the baby and put your hand on them or stroke them and just support them in their lying down position. And, and yes, they are going to cry because that is the way that it is. But it, they generally, you know, you're sitting there, you're soothing them, you're using your voice, you're using your sense of touch, um, or you, you, you're targeting their sense of touch and you're comforting them. And eventually they do settle and go to sleep. Yeah, I found um, the pick up, put down method is quite tiring. When yeah, you're already, it works. already blasted yeah. and, and frazzled, yeah. and you've got to walk in and pick up, put down, pick up, put down. I did that once, I think, the entire night long, and it yeah. was. I mean, I think that did help a bit, yeah. but um, yeah, it was exhausting. So for some for some parents, if they're doing the method that I use, which is put your hand on your little one, um, it can be very. Um, disconcerting because they they cry and then they get distressed and they're looking at you and so so some moms then feel or oh, they must pick them up and give them a little cuddle and put them back down and so as i said you know there's no absolute right and wrong so if mums need to do that they can but then i think always go back to aiming to have them settle on their own lying down perfect awesome okay can we move to night terrors yeah, so night terrors are an interesting thing. So um, you, you get um, night terrors and nightmares. Um, let's start with nightmares. Nightmares are usually only seen from 18 months onwards because a nightmare is a language and, and, and imagination-based fear. So um, in other words, there's a whole story that's happening in a little one's head when they have a nightmare. You know, there's somebody who's naughty who's coming to get them or there's a dog that's barking or there's somebody in their room. You know, there's a, there's a story that children have. And th that... Um, ability to actually have um, the mind actually create stories uh, um, and imagination only really comes when language is, is developing and so from about 18 months onwards. So it's very unusual to see nightmares under 18 months, but certainly going into the toddler years as imagination explodes, you're likely to see a lot of nightmares. Night terrors are different. Night terrors we can see earlier. We can see them um, all the way from like six months onwards. Um, and the big difference between a nightmare and a night terror is that with a nightmare, your little one is awake. So um, you go into the room, they're screaming, and they're kind of pointing at um, a boogeyman or can articulate it, or they're pointing, just pointing at something, um, and they look fearful. Whereas with a night terror, mostly children are fast asleep still. So you go into the room, they're screaming blue murder, but they're actually dead asleep. Um, the advice with um, night terrors is not to wake little ones, is just to, um, you, I like to use deep pressure, so just put your hands on your little one and give them deep pressure. That tends to work quite well. Um, and um, yeah, and then, and then also just to watch over tiredness, because one of the things that we know that is associated with night terrors is, is over tiredness. So it'll often come about when you hit those cusp ages, which is where you go from like three sleeps down to two sleeps, or two sleeps to one sleep, or one sleep to no sleeps. And when that happens, you often have a slightly overtired little one that can have a night terror. Yeah, I actually find, even as an adult now, I mean, I don't have night terrors now, but um, I found, and this is something that my husband just cannot understand, is that if I'm having problems with my insomnia and I am struggling to sleep, it actually, it kind of, it spirals. So the more tired I am, the more problems I have. Mm -hmm. And most people would that you know okay you're exhausted you you you're lacking sleep so when you go to sleep tonight you're going to just go to sleep and catch up um and i found for myself that this just doesn't work so mm -hmm. I, yeah i totally see how that would be the same for babies mm, exactly yeah yeah awesome okay and then the next thing i want to know about is sleep progression and um i think what i read was that you know when babies reach different milestones and of course when they drop sleeps but when they become more active like there was a time where my son like he's always been a really good sleeper but he started learning how to roll he started learning how to sit how to stand and then it wasn't it was very different for my daughter because she would just scream all night um my son he just wanted to practice his moves <laughs> and i found that very frustrating yeah yeah so sleep regressions happen at at different um, for different reasons. Um, your first real sleep regression happens at about 17 weeks. Um, and that's a, a developmental milestone where little ones are having to learn to self-soothe. Um, before that, they, they don't have memory long-term and so they're not really forming habits. But from 17 weeks onwards, they do and they start to just rely on, on whatever they're using to get to sleep. So if it's your breast or if it's a dummy or if it's being rocked to sleep. 
So, so that's why sleep regression often um, crop, crops up there is because little ones haven't learned to self-soothe. So that was what I was talking about earlier on is that you really do want your little one to learn to self-soothe um, at around that time, at around 17 weeks, between 17 and, and 24 weeks. Um, so that's your first sleep regression. It also coincides, interestingly, with when solids are starting. So a lot of people think that it's got to do with hunger. Um, you know, we find that you don't really have a magic wand that goes with um, food, that as you introduce solids at 17 weeks or 20 weeks or whatever it is, that babies start to sleep through the night. But what we do know is that if you delay introducing solids too close to six months, then you can end up with a little one who actually, um, you know, does, does, um, Need, need nutritional comfort at night or, or nutrition at night and so they wake up for that so you you do want to introduce solids not too late um, because it does make a difference and then so that's the first sleep regression another sleep regression happens at around about nine months which is your separation anxiety uh, it's a classic stage as little ones develop what's called object permanence they then start to know when mom's not around and so then they you know call her back repeatedly at night that's our sleep regression our separation anxiety sleep regression and then as you mentioned there's also the milestone sleep regressions which is um you know as they learn to walk they like they have to stand up in their cot and practice their skills so you know it's kind of that practicing of skills that kind of interferes and those can be much more variable they, they'll happen depending on that individual child's um uh, milestones and when those happen and then the last sleep regression happens in the toddler years and that's got to do with um, pushing the boundaries so they start to know that they can push the boundaries oh. and it's yeah <laughs> Yes, I'm familiar with that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm interested to know, um, yeah, the, the, the starting solids is definitely a, um, a sort of conflicting um, school of thought there, the four month versus six months. Yeah, so um, look, it's, it's, it's old fashioned advice to wait until six months. Um, it, it came about because um, when we when little ones were having allergies, we thought erroneously that if we introduced solids later, it would limit the, the risk of allergies. But actually it's the other way around. And that's why introducing solids earlier is actually better. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's not that there's a specific time to introduce solids. It can be at six, at um, four months and it can be at six months. Um, but it's usually sometime in the middle of that. And I think, again, you know, like I had said earlier, don't be too prescriptive, don't have too many expectations, rather, you know, just, um, you know, kind of watch your baby's own signals and know that your baby's perfectly able to be weaned between four and six months. But doesn't mean that you have to, you can wait to six months if you want to, but definitely not later than that. Yeah, yeah. My son started swiping our food. I did my daughter at four months and then I did my son at six months. And he started just before the six months milestone. He started trying to swipe our food. So I, I let him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So I want to just have a look at some of our questions here. We've got 56. There are a lot of them. Wow. Yeah. So we've got a number of ladies saying good morning. Hi, ladies. Um, let me just have a look here and see. It was quite a nice question I saw um, around the link between autism and, and night terrors, which was very interesting because, oh. um, yeah, it was, um, I'm sure I'm just having a look to try and catch it again. Um, it was a very interesting question. Let me try and find it. Um, but the answer to the question is that um, there is some sort of correlation between poor sleep and um, autism. In fact, autistic children actually sleep terribly badly. Um, in general, um, and not, there is an association with um, sleep regression and sensory sensitivity, and there's a correlation between sensory sensitivity and autism. So the answer to the question, because it's a really interesting question, is that yes, there is um, an association between it, but it certainly doesn't work. It only works one way. It doesn't work the other way. So in other words, just because your child has night terrors doesn't mean they're likely to be autistic at all. So please don't worry about that, mums. But um, if a baby is... Um, is autistic, then yes, they are more likely to be sensory sensitive and have some night terrors. So yeah, I hope that answers that question. It's a really, it's that, that question um, was a good one, Hannah's, uh, Hannah's question. Interesting, I'll find that just now. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got Lisa asking that the earlier you establish a routine, the better. Yes, it definitely, um, the, the earlier you work on sleep issues, the better, there's no question. Um, in terms of, um, the, the, you know, routines, you don't have to start a routine too early because remember, little ones can't be fed on an absolute routine when they're very young. 
but um, you can start to work them towards a sleep routine, yes. And it is the earlier the better because ha habits can be, become very firmly established. Ah, and that leads us right into the next question here where Michelle's asking about getting a baby out of a routine or out of a bad habit. Yeah, so, um, you know, if, if, if there's a routine that's a bad habit, so, so let's talk about two things here. One is her daily routine. That's just shifting it. You just shift it overnight. Like, like let, let's say you've got um, Michelle's 13-month-old is sleeping three times in the day. That would be a problem because you will you will have disrupted sleep. So, like for instance, she's she's having her last sleep of the day at four p.m. and it goes until eight, and then she's only getting to sleep at ten o'clock at night. You know, and that that happens with thirteen month olds. That would be a case of just change it overnight, get your little one onto the right day routine. But I think what Michelle also might be talking about are those little routines, like for instance, feed to sleep or rock to sleep. Um, and it is a case of just trying daily. It really is of making that shift. Um, and little ones learn, you know, often when moms say to me, um, how do I stop the feed to sleep? Stop offering it, you know? How do I, it, it's, it's, and I know that it sounds easier than, it's easier to say than done, but the reality is that until you take that step to stop offering the, that milk in the middle of the night, for instance, with a 13 month old, um, you're not gonna make any progress. So you do need to just get started. Good advice. Yeah, I, actually, one of the things my daughter, we stopped doing the bottle at about three years old. She just wanted a bottle at night. And, you know, you get so exhausted that you don't want to stop the bottle. But then, once again, you get stuck in this this rut. Yeah. Yeah, we've got Robin asking how to get a baby to stop with the dummy. Um, a baby's 20 months old. My suggestion is to do it in two parts. The first part, and this is the perfect age to do it at 20 months, is to stop offering it during the day. You only offer it for sleep time. So for day sleeps and night sleeps. So what I would normally do is actually pin the dummy or connect the dummy to the bed or the cot. Um, so that your little one learns that there's only one time that they can have the dummy and that's literally when they're in their, in their cot. Um, and the reason why that's a good idea is that once you, when you do that, you take away that all, always, on in, always on dependence on it. Um, so if you're trying to break a habit and you're going from like, always in the mouth to nothing obviously it's going to be more difficult so the best way to do it is to start limiting it, limiting it only to sleep times and that about 18 months is the time to do that and then after that you can get rid of it and you know i'm not very prescriptive on when to get rid of dummies um i think they're not a major thing so as long as they're only being used for sleep times that's fine um but i mean if you wanted to get rid of it at two and a half or three years old then um what i did was i told my little ones a wonderful story about um in the case of my son, we had gone to the, the Kruger and he'd seen a hyena. And I said, those hyenas that make the noises at night, because, of course, they were crying every night, um, they need dummies. And so we get, collected all his dummies and gave it to the hyena and replaced it with a soft toy hyena. And why that's clever is that that then gives him a new, they're a new strategy to self-soothe with as opposed to the dummies. So kind of removing one with the other. Shame. Lynn has got, for those of you who are wondering why Lynn is on the phone, she has got a delivery that's coming through right now. Yes, that's 100% correct, and I'm sorry about that. They always decide to come when I'm live. So I've got another question here. Um, Lisa's asking, uh, Meg, do your your, your sessions, do, do you coach the moms all the way through this process of teaching them to co-regulate with their child? Yes, I do. So I actually have a sleep course, which, as I said, the la it's, today is the last day of, of the current one. And we, we run them kind of every two to three months. Um, we go through 10 master classes. So the parents all watch a video. Um, it's online. And then we get to, they get to ask questions. And so there are actually 10 steps to getting a child to sleep through the night. Only one of those steps is the co-regulation step. And I help you go through all of those different steps as we go along. Awesome. And I think your app also, um, I think someone asked about, oh, I don't know what the question was. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I saw that you've got, you know, it, it guides you through the different stages of your baby's age and all of that. So, you know, instead yeah. of having to research online and see, you know, how, how much is my baby supposed to be sleeping? What time should my baby go to bed? It's mm. all in that one place. So I think the app yeah. would also be fantastic. Yeah, so the app is amazing because the app does two things. Number one, it helps you set up a day sleep routine. There's actually a routine section to the app that actually tells you exactly when your baby should be going down at what time of day. And we know that day sleeps are very important and have a big impact on night sleep. And then um, on the app, there's actually a section. If you click on the, there's, on the home screen, there's four widgets. There's sleep, 
feeding, play, and health. And if you click on the sleep one, it'll take you into an area where there's tips and there's a night tip and a day tip. And if you follow those night tips and day tips all the way through, your baby will sleep through the night because right from the get go, it's establishing the right um, habits for your little one's sleep. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I love the idea of an app because you're so right. I mean, I remember when my first baby was born and I had this pile of books and I was always constantly flipping through them, trying to find the information that I needed for that moment and it's it's actually it's quite tricky and overwhelming and then you often also get contradicting information so this book says you've got to do this and this book says you have to do that um, I remember at one stage I read some book that basically gave you your child's schedule for each age group and it said like your child should be sleeping at this time and at that time and I can just say you can't make your baby sleep during the day at a specific time. You've got to follow your baby and, and kind of, you know, find that sweet spot. Yeah, some babies actually do fit into a really nice routine really easily. Mm -hmm. um, and other babies don't. And I think it's that kind of, um, you know, understanding your baby, not sweating it too much. Um, the book that you might be talking about was the Gina Ford book. And that was a very prescriptive book that told you exactly when to put your baby down and exactly when to wake them. Yeah, um, the sure. app actually, yeah, the app actually does have a section. That, um, if you're on your app and there's, you'll see down at the bottom middle, there's a little heart. And if you click on that heart, it actually gives you a suggested day routine for that for each day. Um, according to what time your baby work in the morning. So I do give you a suggested um, sleep routine, but obviously it's done with flexibility. Yeah, well, like you say, it goes according to the time your baby wakes up. So, I mean, this one said, like, your baby should wake up at this time, but your and baby doesn't wake just up didn't. So yeah. then your baby can't go to sleep at that time on the schedule. It was, it was very frustrating. And, yeah, I learned the hard way. You cannot make your baby fit into a routine that you find in a book that they should yeah. be sleeping at at that age mm. yeah exactly yeah we've got a laundry wanting to know how do you get your baby off the boob yeah so again you know this is the one that is exactly what i had said earlier like stop offering it and at 15 months babies really shouldn't be having milk at night and there's health reasons for that in fact um to do with obesity to do with nutritional um you know that, that they need their nutrients from solids not from milk to do with habits, to do with tooth cavities, to do with ear infections. Um, breastfeeding at night increases the risk of all of those things once you're into the toddler years. And so it is better not to breastfeed at night once they're 15 months old. And the only way to do it is to just stop offering it. And, and remember, Landry, that the way that your little one um, wants to be put back to sleep in the middle of the night, which in your case, four to five times wants to be fed, um, is exactly because of how they're getting to put to sleep in the evening. So you need to start with bedtime and you need to get your little one to go down off the breast. And then when they do wake up at night at 15 months, I would be offering water rather than breast milk. Yeah, that's exactly the same problem that we had with my daughter. Mm. Um, we've got Alta wants to know, is it bad if your baby's four and still drinks the bottle? Um, yeah, lots of people don't like that, but I'm, again, quite flexible on that. You know, I think, I think a couple of things. If they're drinking the bottle, um, and the amount of milk they're having is appropriate or what they drink in their bottle is, is correct. And we'll talk about that. Then it's no problem. And if they're not doing it at night. So those are the kind of, you know, it's, it's what and when. So when we talk about the what of bottles in um, from what, one year onwards is that um, it's cow's milk. It's not formula or breast milk. It's cow's milk that you would be giving your baby or toddler. And um, for your one year old, it's kind of 300 mils of milk, which means, you know, kind of it's usually about 60 mils in the morning and, you know, and maybe 180 mils, um, you know, in the in the evening or, you know, 120 and 180 so that you end up with about 300 mils of milk in the day. So limiting the amount. And therefore, if, if you think about that, only having a bottle on waking in the morning and on sleep in the evening. So it's it's more about not giving the bottle too often um, that's important. And then the second thing about the bottle is the what, because um, if you if bottles can cause teeth, tooth cavities because you've obviously got the milk hanging around the mouth area um, and milk has got um, sugar in it, but fruit juice has got even more sugar in it. And so don't give fruit juice in a bottle, just give milk and just give it on waking and, and in the evening. And most little ones will stop using a bottle at around about that age anyway. Great advice. Okay, we've got Lisa, and this is also something I would love to know. What are your views on co-sleeping? Yeah, co-sleeping co is absolutely fine. It's very personal. So for some mums, 
they don't want their little one co-sleeping with them because they like their own space in their bed. Um, for some dads, that is, they have the same feeling and it's very important that you recognize your partner's thoughts and feelings on it. So that, that's the first thing is like, can you actually sleep with your baby in your bed? I personally couldn't. I needed my space. So I like my babies in their own space, but there's nothing wrong. If you love the comfort of it, you love having a little one close to you, that's fine. Uh, the only thing I would say is that um, up until 12 months, there is an increased risk of cot deaths or SIDS with um, babies co-sleeping. After a year, that um, risk disappears completely. So co-sleeping with toddlers is not a problem um, for SIDS. But under a year, the risk is there. And so um, I would just be very cautious about um, having good sleep, co-sleeping hygiene. So um, as an example, you mustn't drink any alcohol. You mustn't take any painkillers because you don't want to be too drowsy. Um, your baby must have their own space in your bed. They mustn't use your duvet. They must have their own blanket. The bed must be firm. Um, they mustn't be near a pillow. So all of those sort of things um, can help prevent um, cot death. Um, and, and I think that is the one thing that you do need to think about if you've chosen to co-sleep. Awesome. Yeah, we, we co-slept a lot, not really by choice, I suppose. Well, I mean, I suppose everything is a choice, but it was just that my daughter was awake so much and crying so much. And then, of course, it's winter and it's cold. And yeah, so then I climb in the bed and we all cried and <laughs> screamed and <laughs> stuck together. Yeah, um, I've got an interesting one here. Um, and, and this is something that also happened with, with, with me. Uh, Mariska's asking, is it important that they sleep during the day? So her child is 21 months old and fights it. Um, my daughter stopped sleeping through during the day at 18 months. That was my problem mm -hmm. sleeper. And it was because it was just such a, a drama to get her to sleep that I'd spend two hours or two, two to three hours sometimes trying to get her to have a nap. And then she would sleep for maybe 20 minutes or 10 minutes and be awake again. Um, yeah. And eventually she just stopped. Yeah, so toddlers drop their day sleep at very variable times. Um, some toddlers um, drop their day sleep at like 18 months. And some of them, like my my middle child who carried hers on until she was five years old or six years old, actually. So, you know, it's very variable. The one thing that I would say to Mariska and other parents is that it's very important that all children until four years old have a day rest. And that means just a time of day where they have to go to their room and they don't have to sleep because you you know you can take a, um, a horse to water you can't make a drink so they don't have to sleep and they can read on their bed or play lego or just hum to themselves listen to music but they do need a day rest and i think if you get that discipline going um, particularly with the 21 month old is what you'll find is that kind of maybe three out of seven night days they actually do have that midday sleep and four out of seven they don't have that midday sleep so um keep the habit of a day rest um, but if she's not going to sleep, then that's, yeah, that's the way it is. Oh, I like that. That's not something I was aware of. We just stopped the day sleep. No, and they tend to actually wean themselves off it. It's, it's almost never overnight. So they'll, you do like three days, or two days on, two days off, you know, one day on, one day off, and then eventually, you know, four days without a sleep and only three days and eventually drop it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got Raisa asking, I mean, how do you get the baby to self-soothe? So you've told us about teaching a baby to put the dummy in their mouth. Um, are there any other tips? Yeah, so, yeah, so there are a couple of things. One is that you need to give them the opportunity to. So if you keep on fixing for them all the time and never giving them the opportunity to self-soothe themselves, then obviously they're not going to self-soothe. So the first thing would be, you know, to listen before you respond instantly. And obviously it depends on the age of the baby because if you've got a newborn, you've got to respond instantly. But for, once they're over four months, which is when they can self-soothe, you can start to just listen for a little bit, not let them cry it out, but just listen. Um, you can also um, start to use your voice when you enter the room because then they start to use their auditory sense to self-soothe. And, and so you, as you walk into the room, say, hello, my love, I'm here, you know, if, they, if they're crying. And often they'll quiet or they'll get their hands to their mouth then because they've heard your voice. Um, also, getting their hands towards their mouth is a really good idea. So when you hold your baby, hold them with their elbows kind of um, towards each other, and then they can get their hands up to their mouth because that teaches them to use their hands to soothe. And then obviously, um, doo-doo blankies are a big way to self-soothe. So give them a little blankie that they can actually use to self-soothe instead of you. Perfect. Um, we've got Angelique asking about her baby um, and asking if her child is a good two-hour nap during the day but still wakes up at night time, would this be caused by being undertired or maybe cut down the length of the nap? Um, 
Yeah, Angelique, you don't give the age of your child, which I think would be a very important. Yeah, I can't answer the question without the age of the child, but let's just say her child's a toddler and she has one two hour nap and she's still waking down at, at wakes up at night time. Um, she could actually be having too much sleep. So, um, you know, if you're having a, a two hour sleep, so let's say she's 22 months, you know, between two and three years old, um, then a two hour nap is quite long and then that can cause night wakings. But, you know, if, she, if she's having a good two hour nap and she's, let's say, between one and two, that's appropriate then um, it's probably more likely to be something else. Okay, okay she's awesome. actually said she's 20 months old. I see her, I see in the comments there. Oh, so okay. yeah, so for a 20 month old, um, no, I think the two uh, nap is exactly perfect. Um, it's more likely to be how you're putting her to sleep um, at bedtime. I would look at that. I would look at deworming her. I would look at um, the, um, the, 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 the food that she's eating. She needs an iron rich diet. It's all of that type of thing. Perfect. Thank you, Meg. Um, and then we've got two questions here from Divu. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, she's asking, firstly, can, can teething cause night terrors? And can night terrors look like seizures? Yeah, so teething can't cause night terrors. They, those are not connected at all. Teething just causes discomfort at night. Um, and it's only for a couple of nights over the actual eruption of the tooth. And can night terrors look like seizures? Yes, they can, because they can look like the child is in such a panic. But, you know, um, she has asked a couple of questions around um, autism and around night terrors. So clearly her little one is experiencing night terrors. And there's actually, I don't know where she's based, but there's a very good um, medical doctor in Johannesburg um, who um, is a real expert on this, um, Alison Bentley. And, and, you know, if you are having quite severe night terrors, I would actually go and chat to her because she's, she's the expert on it. Um, you said Alison Bentley. Yeah, Alison Bentley, like the car. She's a, she's actually the, she used to, and I'm not sure if she still is, she used to be the head of, of sleep research um, at Wits University. I'm not sure if she still oh, is perfect. now. Okay, yeah. I'm just making notes so I can add that to my blog post yeah. for later. Perfect. Yeah, yeah that would be very helpful. My mother probably could have done with that doctor when I was a baby. So, Yeah, she's yeah. she really is excellent. Awesome. Uh, we've got um, Angelique that's asking what age is acceptable to transition from crib to bed? Um, yeah, so again, so, so with this one, I, I, I prefer people not to move their little ones into, oh gosh, I see my computer's about to die. Let me just quickly um, pop like in my that. thing. Um, yeah, so I prefer them not to transition their little ones into a bed until two years old. Um, and the reason is that babies don't have the um, kind of um, kind of almost the mental self-discipline or the, what we call behavioral self-regulation um, under two years of age. So at about two years of age, little ones start to develop what are called tools of the mind, which is the way in which that they can do self-talk to actually tell themselves what they need to be doing. It's, it's a behavioral state, it's a behavioral regulation stage. And they can't do that under two. So you know, to, to have them being told that they can't get out of bed under two um, is very difficult. And that's why we actually need bars around them is that they, they then, you know, they're kind of confined in a space by, by physical structure, not just with the tools of their mind. So 24 months is the right time. Perfect. I'm um, just around the right time that they start getting rebellious and jumping out of bed, but they can understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. And uh, we've got Michelle just asking about your app. Um, will it still work if her child is 13 months? No, unfortunately not. It only goes from tw from birth to 12 months. Um, we are going to develop more uh, um, content, but at the moment um, it is just for, for babies, not to one. And we do have, um, just so people know, they, um, there is a discounted price on the website. So if you go into the website, which is parentsense.app, um, and you go to membership up at the top of the page um, or, or pricing options, you will then be able to actually um, buy it on the website. And when you do that, you get a discounted price. The other option is to do it through the um, app store. Um, you still will have to download it through the app store, but once you've got membership, you give, get access to it at the, at the website price. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've got Caitlin asking about um, her 23 month old that still cries for the bottle during the night. And if she gives water, she cries but drinks that as well. And she wants to know how can she stop her from drinking during the night so that she doesn't wake up wanting things to drink? 
babies who wait for water usually just kind of break that habit on their own. So I would actually suggest using the water one. And I, I actually have nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with just sticking a whole lot of bottles of water into the cot so they can use it independently. Um, because they outgrow it. Water's not bad for teeth. It doesn't lead to obesity. It's I have no problem with a water bottle in the cot. Um, but if she's waking to, for, um, for milk, then that is an issue. Hmm. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've got Angelique. Um, her toddler wants nothing to do with cow's milk from 15 months old. Um, I yeah. don't know if that's a question or if it's a... <laughs> Statement. So, I'll, I mean, I'll answer it anyway. It's um, it's absolutely fine. Babies don't need cow's milk at all after 12 months. They don't, don't really need milk. Um, you can put dairy into diet in solids. So cottage cheese, yogurts, um, cheese. Those are all good options for getting dairy into the diet. Um, and even with the dairy, they don't have to have dairy. You know, there are other lovely milks that are out there like almond milk or oat milk. So, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not obsessed with toddlers having milk. They don't need it as long as they're eating well. Oh, that's good to know. My son, when I weaned him at 13 months old off the breast, he was like, I don't want a bottle. I don't want a dummy. I don't want milk if it's not in the boob. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them are like that. And we also find sometimes that they actually have lactose intolerance, underlying lactose intolerance. And I mean, my daughter was like that. She just went off the bottle. The minute she had solids, she just stopped the bottle, even younger than a year. She didn't want any milk. Um, and to this day, um, she's a teenager now and she has lactose intolerance just the way it is so she her body she was following her body she was being an intuitive eater perfect okay um we've got raiza asking um what at what age you should start a sleep routine her baby's eight weeks old yeah so you can start at eight weeks old a sleep routine and um, just watch the awake times that's the critical thing there so you want to watch um what time your baby wake up woke up and then put them back to sleep you know, kind of within a certain amount of time after that. So for an eight week old, it's about an hour. So you can start a sleep routine. Um, and Risa, I would actually get the app if I were you um, because that'll guide you with your routine and the times. Yeah, perfect. Um, we've got a question here. It's, it's, um, it's not sleep related, but maybe you can give some advice. It's Alta. She says when her child gets hurt or falls down or something upsets him, he stops breathing. Yes. So, um, so a couple of things. We sometimes actually see that with little ones who are iron deficient, who have iron deficiency anemia. So that's the first thing I would do is rule out medical reasons for this. So she needs to go and have him checked um, at the by the doctor properly, um, and that'll require blood tests um, to to determine that. And then you'll be put onto a very specific um, uh, uh, um, iron supplement um, because that's a medical issue. Um, so that's that's one option the other one is that um you know that he, he's becoming so distressed that he's not able to self-regulate and so he undermines his physiological stability and stops breathing and that we do see um and you know there it is really just helping them to co-regulate you know so hold them and hug them give them lots of comfort until um until they can take a breath it's it's very very scary though alter i mean i've dealt with little ones who do that and i know how scary it is um uh, you know, the, the good news is that they don't they don't die from it. It's just scary for us as parents. Well, that's good to know. Um, I'm glad that I haven't experienced that myself. Um, we've got Sanal here with her 13 month old that keeps waking up at 4 a.m. Um, yeah, I, I, I've had this as well. You know, in winter when your kid gets up at 4 a.m. and like mm -hmm. the day begins and it's cold and dark, what can you do to get your child to sleep a bit later? Mm, it's, it's, there's nothing you can do it's that four o'clock is just a nightmare because i mean it really is it's the one sleep issue that i can't fix because you can't do sleep training at that time of day and uh, it's it's not fair in your little one you can do a couple of things like make sure you've got block out lining on the on the window so that they don't see the light use a sleeping bag so that they're warm and don't have that drop in body temperature i actually believe in what she's doing which is um bringing them into your bed or offering them a bottle at that time it's the only time i do think that night bottles are okay because there's nothing else you can do um and so i call it breaking all the rules so you just break all the rules at four if it's four o'clock in the morning but even when you do all that often we have little ones who just um yeah who just wake up at four it's it's very frustrating I wish I had a magic one because I would be very well for that one. <laughs> I was just going to say I'm very disappointed mm. you don't have a magic tip for that um, because Sorry. we had a lot of it as well. And I mean, mm. the amount of times that we were up at 4 a.m. was it was crazy. And I remember Killer. my daughter, the period of about mm. four or five months, 
because she woke up every day at four. She'd be awake for three hours and then she'd fall asleep for like a period of about another hour. It was absolutely mm. awful. It, you know, yeah. it, it's your whole day and your, oh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got Caitlin asking, her baby's two months old and when he lies in the crib, he keeps making sounds that he's uncomfortable. Um, and how can she make the crib more comfortable for him? So, yeah, look, I mean, I think we, we mustn't get hung up on babies, new, especially newborns um, noises. They are, they're just a very noisy and sometimes they sound like they're quite uncomfortable, but they're actually fine. So if they, as long as he's not crying and he's just grunting and grimacing, I would just ignore it. Um, one of the things you can do, because you say he's much more comfortable when he sleeps um, on, on the couch, and by the way, sleeping on the couch is, is a really, really risky place for babies to sleep. It's, it is a, has a very confir a really confirmed link to, to SIDS. Um, so I wouldn't have him sleep on the couch. Um, and particularly if you're sleeping on the couch as well, that, that's the biggest risk factor. Um, but what I would say is that there is a, um, there are a couple of kind of sleep inserts that you can buy. Um, one is called uh, Sleepy Head or Docker Tot. There's another one called um, the Nurture One Cushion. And all of those are quite nice because they give little ones boundaries and, and containment and, it, and they do sleep better like that. Oh, fantastic. Um, we have another one that's not sleep related. Um, Jeanette's got her child that is not chewing food and just swallows everything whole. Um, how can you help your child learn how to chew and not choke? Mm, that's yeah. an interesting one. Um, look, I would, I would. She, she says a whole puff. I'm not too sure what a puff is, but maybe like a little piece of puffed wheat or something. Um, I would go with really um, mushy food initially, so things like um, steamed butternut and steamed broccoli, things that just disintegrate. Um, and see whether or not that would work. Um, I actually, it's not usual to come across a little one who, who just swallows food whole, um, but um, I suppose what you could do is also mash it so that it, it isn't just um, being swallowed whole. Mm. Perfect. Uh, we've got one question here from Roxy. Her baby's 18 weeks old and the sleep is very erratic uh, during the night, waking up three times or more. Is this a sleep regression? Um, if, if um, Roxy, if she's been a good sleeper until now, then yes, this is the sleep regression um, because it does happen in about 17, 18 weeks. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, it's important to watch the awake times. Again, um, get the app because that'll definitely help you with the right times. Um, and um, if your little one's waking up regularly at night, um, start to guide them towards times when they can wake. So, for instance, um, if your little one's waking at 10 and you're not going to feed then offer some water and then only offer milk at 12 let's say for instance um also listen at night give your little one the opportunity to self-soothe and resettle to sleep because this is that stage where we want little ones to to start to piece together self-soothing yeah and here's another spin on that as she says ps she has to rock her to sleep with every so nap, that's why so. yeah so that's why she's waking because <laughs> if, you, if you if you're rocking her that she will wake yeah Perfect. Um, and then Michelle wants to know where she can get hold of sleep tips besides on the app. Um, I know Megan's Meg's written a lot of books um, and you do courses as well. Yeah. So, the, the I mean, the, my book Sleep Sense is a really good option. And if you've got the app, you don't even have to subscribe to the app and then you can get the book as an ebook on the app. Um, so, you know, I would do that is, is actually use have a look at the book on the app. Um, my sleep courses come up every third month, generally every second or third month. Um, and then inside the app is a good option. Perfect. Awesome. We're running out of yeah, time. Yeah, we've finished There's our time. One last question here. We've got uh, Mika. Um, her son is one and he wakes up once a night for milk and wants her to help self-soothe. But he doesn't want – he sleeps with a duty blanket but doesn't fall asleep by himself. What can she do differently? Just be consistent with him. Always offer the doo-doo blankie and just make sure that whatever you do before every sleep, as well as in the middle of the night, that it's something that your child can use independently of you. So so rocking to sleep, feeding to sleep is not stuff they can use independently. And just be very consistent with putting those in place. Perfect. Awesome. Um, I think there may be a few other... No, that's Unfortunately, I'm out of time. It's been it's been so lovely chatting with you, Liz. Thank you so much, and lovely to meet all the mums on your platform. 
Perfect. Um, yeah, I, we did hit all the main questions. I was like flying through them and I see we've basically finished everything. So I'm, I'm quite chuffed that we got through all of that. Oh, um, Meg, thank brilliant. you so much. Um, I know I've had you on my page previously before, but that was only in comments. So it's a really amazing experience to have you live and have all of your knowledge shared with everybody. Um, okay. I'm just going to announce a winner quickly. Um, I've chosen um, Raisa Hussein. She's got the eight-week-old baby, so she'll uh -huh. get She's going to get the app. Use out of the app. Um, Raisa, you can um, either inbox me your email address or you can email me lynn at kaboki.com. If you're not watching still, I'll come and find you and contact you. And, yeah, um, thank you so much, Meg. This has been absolutely okay. fantastic. A real pleasure. Really, really pleasure. It's always lovely for me to connect with the mums and to be on your platform. Thank you, Lynn. Perfect. And everybody have a wonderful Friday. Goodbye Thanks from us. Thanks very much. Cheers.